Well, thank you to everybody for joining us this afternoon. This is a Brodie's webinar presented by myself, Ian Rutherford, Monica Connolly, Senior Associate, and Ross Campbell, Associate, and we all work in the ITIP disputes team here at Brodie's. In a second, I'll hand over to Ross, um, who's going to give um, a bit more of a detailed overview of the CIS against IBM case. Uh, Ross will then hand over to Monica to speak about the triple point case. Um, and then I'll wrap up with some cases which aren't necessarily IT specific, but which have got relevant elements that could apply to IT contracts to try and wrap everything up. But the focus for today is primarily on the two cases, CIS and Triple Point. But then we thought it would be a bit more useful if you had some cases that were maybe of more wider application um, that we could cover off at the end. Um, and that's everything from me at this stage before I kind of pick things up at the end. So I will hand over to Ross to speak about the CIS against IBM case. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, so as Ian said, I'm, I'm just going to give a, a bit of an overview of the recent decision in England in uh, the case of CIS General Insurance against IBM United Kingdom, uh, just because this, this really highlights some of the issues that can arise in disputes relating to complex IT contracts. Um, so I, I've just set out the parties there and tried to summarise what was actually quite a, a, a complex claim. Essentially, CIS and IBM had a contract relating to the development of a new IT system for CIS's insurance business. IBM terminated that contract. CIS claimed that they were not entitled to do so and sought payment in respect of wasted expenditure and various other losses allegedly arising as a result. Uh, so on to the next slide. Um, I've set out some of the key dates in the timeline. Um, as you'll see, the parties entered into the contract in June 2015. Uh, it was a relatively high value contract. Uh, IBM engaged Innovation Group as subcontractors to supply software and services for the platform using their software insurer suite. Um, contractual completion dates for the home and motor insurance platforms were then not met. Uh, and IBM recognizing some of the issues with their subcontractor then exercised audit rights and then step in rights against IG. Um, on to the next slide. Um, notwithstanding all of that, uh, around the same time in March 2017, IBM submitted an invoice for 2.9 million roughly to CIS in respect of Milestone. Uh, it was Milestone application gate 5, referred to as Milestone AG5, which IBM claimed reflected payments which were due in respect of software licenses and had become payable in January 2017. CIS refused to accept or pay the invoice uh, and then in May gave notice of its intention to exercise rights of set off against any sums that were due in respect of the invoice. Then in June, IBM served a final notice and CIS still didn't pay. Um, and then in July, IBM exercised a contractual right of termination on the basis of CIS's failure to pay the invoice. CIS disputed this and claimed that there had in fact been a repudiatory breach. Um, and that, that led to the dispute um, and various claims being raised by CIS. Uh, those included primarily a, a claim for damages for wasted costs arising out of the alleged wrongful termination. Um, there was a breach of contractual warranty claim and other claims uh, in relation to fail alleged failures uh, in relation to uh, reporting. Um, and IBM, you'll see their counterclaimed and sought payment of uh, their invoice for the AG5 milestone. On to the next slide, um, set out the four main issues there that the court was looking to determine um, here. And going on to the next slide there, I've dealt with these uh, in turn. Um, so in relation to issue one, the first one was whether IBM was entitled to exercise its termination rights due to CIS's failure to pay the invoice. Now, here IBM had claimed that it was entitled to payment of the invoice in respect of milestone AG5, regardless of any failures to meet other milestones. It was said that it was a delayed invoice for software licenses, which was not linked to the overall, prog overall progress of the project. They said that CIS had wrongfully failed to pay the invoice and was not entitled to exercise any right of set off because any such right was exercised too late. As a result, IBM was entitled to exercise its contractual right to terminate. Now, the court agreed in relation to payment of the invoice being due, but not in relation to termination. It was determined that the invoice had become due and payable on January 2017, and that there was no ground upon which CIS could withhold payment. 
It was a freestanding milestone with no direct predecessors and was not dependent upon the completion of prior or other milestones. It would have been open to parties to have agreed this in the contract, but they did not. It was also found that the AG5 invoice had been prepared and submitted in accordance with the contract. Uh, CIS had rejected the invoice because there hadn't been a purchase order number, but CIS had withheld that purchase order number, so it was found that they were not entitled to rely upon their own breach here. CIS also made various other assertions, um, which IBM considered were trivial, such as minor errors in the invoice, uh, and ultimately these arguments were rejected. However, uh, it was still found that uh, CIS did validly dispute the invoice. The court concluded that CIS believed that they were entitled to do so and had acted in good faith. Um, however, when it came to the set-off, they had not asserted any right of equitable set-off in accordance with the agreed procedures, and so they could not make that claim here. Um, therefore, as CIS had validly disputed the invoice, it was found that IBM's purported termination amounted to a repudiatory breach of contract, which CIS had accepted. Now, moving on to the next slide, um, which dealt with the next issue the court looked at, and that was whether IBM was in breach of the contractual warranty. Uh, CIS's case was that IBM had contractually warranted that it had taken all reasonable steps and satisfied itself as to all risk, contingencies, and circumstances as to its performance of the agreement. Uh, and CIS said that that warranty was untrue. They said that the insurer suite uh, product was not a proven commercial off-the-shelf product that was highly configurable and capable of meeting most of CIS's requirements. And they claimed damages on the basis that CIS claimed they wouldn't have entered into the contract if they'd known that the warranty was untrue. IBM disputed that, and they said that the platform was capable of, of being delivered to meet the requirements of CIS. Now, in relation to this aspect of the claim, CIS's claim here failed on the facts. It was found that IBM had taken all reasonable steps to identify the risks and did not misrepresent the nature and scope of the required development of the product. Uh, and on the point of whether CIS would have entered into the contract of all reasonable steps taken by, by IBM had disclosed any alleged substantial rewriting, it was found that they wouldn't have. However, in any event, it was concluded that the insurer suite did not take substantial rewriting and development to meet CIS's needs. Moving on then to, to issue three, um, whether IBM was in breach for failing to report on the true state of the project. Uh, this was a claim arising out of delays to the project. Uh, it, was it was claimed that a material factor in the late delivery of the platform was that Insurer Suite had been developed for use in the US, but not in the UK. And the IG, the subcontractor, didn't have the necessary resources to carry out and complete substantial rewriting and development that was required within the contractual timescales. Here, damages were claimed on the basis that uh, IBM had allegedly not satisfied its reporting obligations. Now, as referred to in the previous issue, the court held that the IG Insurer Suite product did not require substantial rewriting or development to meet CIS's needs, um, and therefore uh, that that part of the claim failed. Um, the contract did not attribute to IBM its subcontractor's knowledge for the purposes of IBM reporting, for the purposes of IBM's reporting obligations. Uh, and by October, November 2015, IBM was not aware that IG's insurer suite had been written for the US market and not the UK market. In any event, it was found that CIS had failed to satisfy the court that it would have terminated the agreement in 2015 or by February 2016. Now, moving on to issue four, and that was whether IBM was in breach for any delays and or failures to report in respect of such delays. Here, it was found that IBM was responsible for the critical delays to the project. The cause of these was, that the cause of these critical delays was that IG's inadequate resources to perform the customization and configuration and to deliver the adequate functionality required to meet the release dates. The customization and configuration work done by IG was of poor quality the number of defects found in relation to the UAT was substantially more than expected by IBM, and IG was slow to resolve and fix these issues. However, again, the court did not accept that CIS would have terminated the contract if IBM had provided more accurate reporting here. One other interesting point to note on that is that IBM had also claimed that there'd been various delays and failures by CIS. However, they failed on that point as whilst IBM did have the option of serving a relief notice on CIS where there was an underlying problem, which was the fault of CIS, they didn't do this. 
So they were then unable to obtain relief, even if the failure to complete project milestones could be attributable to the faults of CIS. The court also looked at whether or not there could be an implied right here and confirmed that such a right of relief could not be implied where there was an express relief clause such as this. So that's the, the issues that the court considered and, and moving on to the next slide there looks at what the, the result of this was in terms of the quantum of the claim. And quite significantly here was the fact that there was an exclusion clause in the contract. So CIS's primary claim for wasted expenditure was in fact excluded by that clause and failed. The exclusion clause was in respect of indirect or consequential loss, loss of profits, revenue, savings, etc. Uh, and although CIS's claim was framed as one for wasted expenditure, it was found by the court that this simply represented a different method of quantifying the loss of bargain and did not change the characteristics of the losses for which compensation was sought. Accordingly, the claim was excluded, whether quantified as the value of the lost profit, revenue or savings, or as wasted expenditure. It's also worth noting, just, just briefly in relation to quantum, that um, reference was made to various contractual caps uh, and which of these ought to apply in relation to this part of the claim. Uh, there was also disagreement as to how those contractual caps should be calculated. Um, however, it was noted by the court that this issue effectively fell away due to the court's dismissal of the wasted expenditure claim. Um, it, it was worth just flagging that though, because it, it, it did highlight the potential further difficulties which can arise. Uh, when you're seeking to categorize the liabilities uh, and, and find out which clause uh, they should apply to, uh, and if they have different liability caps, how those are calculated and how those have the potential to significantly reduce the value of the claim. So although the wasted expenditure claim failed, as I've noted in that slide there, um, it was found that there were additional costs which CIS had incurred, which were recoverable and were not caught by the exclusion clause. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but as you'll see, they, they were for things like resources, property costs, and effectively costs which CIS had been seen to, to have incurred and ought to be recoverable here. Um, and moving on to the next slide there, um, which the final slide really just confirms the amounts that were due. It was ultimately found by the court that although the exclusion clause had uh, effectively reduced the claim significantly. Um, CIS was still entitled to recover the sum of 15,887,990 in respect of the additional costs incurred as a, as a result of IBM's breaches. Um, but IBM was nevertheless still entitled to payment of their milestone invoice, and that was to be deducted from the amounts that were due. So just briefly, some takeaway points from, from this case uh, before I hand you on to Monica. I, I think that it's definitely worth noting that the payment in respect of a milestone according, from this case clearly can't be withheld due to failures in respect of other milestones if there's no provision for this in the contract. The case also illustrates the importance of observing the procedures, procedures which are set out in the contract. Here, CIS had validly and in good faith disputed the invoice, even though the reason for doing so was ultimately not accepted and the invoice was payable. And as a result, IBM didn't have the right to terminate the contract. And similarly, IBM had sought to attribute some of the faults and failures experienced here to CIS, but were unable to do so because they'd not served the relevant relief notices on CIS. So I think this case illustrates that following the provisions of the contract can be critical and can have a significant impact on how disputes such as this might be resolved by the courts. The decision to terminate the contract as a result of non-payment of the invoice was referred to by the court as a high-risk strategy. And I think this case is a good example of that and of the complexities which can arise in an IT dispute and the risks of seeking to find upon a particular breach uh, as a basis for terminating the contract. So that's all from me on that. And I'll now pass you over to Monica, um, who's going to discuss another recent decision. Yeah. Can I just jump in, Ross, just before we move on, just because we've got a question specifically on the case, so I think right. it's probably easier to pick it up just at this stage, if that's all right. So apologies, Monica. Um, it, this, we've been asked if the contract had contained a provision that made payment of the invoice for milestone AG5 dependent on the achievement of other milestones, would that have meant that the invoice wasn't payable? I think what the court was saying here is that it potentially would have. Um, here, it was seen as a freestanding uh, milestone, um, but it was effectively suggesting that the parties are free to agree what they wish. So if the parties had agreed that payment of this particular milestone invoice was dependent upon other milestones being achieved, then CIS, I think, would have had a much stronger case for it saying that, they, that 
they weren't required to pay the invoice and I suspect the court would have uh, found that, that they were correct in that. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, thank you, Ross. And uh, Monica, over to you, triple point. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you about the judgment of the Supreme Court in triple point against PTT, which was given in July this year. So firstly, let's look at the background. A software contract was entered into between the parties. Triple Point specialise in the development and implementation of commodities trading software and their customer PTT trades in oil and gas. So Triple Point was to design, install, maintain and license software to PTT. There were two phases to the contract. Phase one involved replacing the existing trading system and phase two involved developing the system to accommodate new types of trade and triple point was to be remunerated in accordance with contractual milestones. So when specified work had been done and steps had been completed. There was a liquidated damages clause in the contract. Um, generally speaking, this sort of clause stipulates what amount of money will be payable as damages for loss caused by breach of contract, irrespective of the loss actually suffered. It's a standard feature of IT commercial construction contracts, commonly providing for damages to be payable at a specified rate for delay in the completion of work. And such a clause is seen to be beneficial because it allows both parties to manage the risk of delay in completion. The customer knows what damages will be payable for delay and it limits the supplier's exposure to liability. The clause here is set out and I've added emphasis. If triple point fails to deliver work within the time specified and the delay has not been introduced by PTT, triple point shall be liable to pay the penalty at the rate of 0.1% of undelivered work per day of delay from the due date for delivery up to the date PTT accepts such work. And as you can see, it's the last part of that clause which was an issue here. Moving on to the next slide. Looking at the timeline, completion of phase one was significantly delayed. PTT ultimately accepted the work completed for stages one and two of phase one and paid the relevant invoice. Thereafter, Triple Point demanded payment in respect of other invoices relating to license agreements and other things. PTT refused to make the payments. They said they weren't payable under the terms of the contract. Triple Point refused to continue working without those payments being made. PTT then terminated the contract on the basis that Triple Point had wrongfully stopped working. And ultimately, work never commenced on preparation of phase two works. Looking at the issues in dispute, so Triple Point commends proceedings against PTT for payment of the sums in its outstanding invoices. And PTT then defended the action and it counterclaimed um, for, for various things. What we're most concerned with here is the second point there, which is liquidated damages under the terms of the contract up to the date of termination. And the main issue, was PTT entitled to liquidated damages up to the date of termination, even though most of the work was never completed by Triple Point and never accepted by PTT? And remember, the clause set out that the liability would um, accrue from the due date for delivery up to the date that PTT accepted the work. So now let's look at the history of the proceedings. In the High Court, it was found that the delay in performance was caused by Triple Point's failure to comply with a contractual obligation to exercise reasonable skill, care and diligence. And that was through negligently failing carefully to plan, program and manage the project and the delays, failing to provide sufficient numbers of suitably qualified staff and other failures. The judge dismissed Triple Point's claims and found that PTT was entitled to damages for breach of contract, including almost three and a half million dollars in respect of liquidated damages for delays prior to termination. Triple Point appealed to the Court of Appeal and PTT cross appealed on other issues. The Court of Appeal overturned the decision of the High Court on liquidated damages. It found that PTT was only entitled to liquidated damages in respect of the works that had been completed by reference to the agreed stages in the contract. And as we know, that was simply phases, stages one and two of phase one, which was a very, very minor part of the contract. This ultimately amounted to only 154,000 US dollars. There was no entitlement up to the point of termination. PTT could not recover liquidated damages in respect of works beyond stages one and two of phase one because Triple Point never completed and no further work was ever accepted. This Court of Appeal decision created significant uncertainty within the IT and the construction industries in particular. It suggested that liquidated damages might not be available if contracts are terminated when there's been no acceptance of works 
when the clause referred to liquidated damages for delay accruing up until completion or acceptance of those works. Then PTT appealed to the Supreme Court. And we'll look at that next. The Supreme Court looked at whether the Court of Appeals approach, the liquidated damages were not available when the supplier had not completed the work was correct. And it found that its approach was inconsistent with commercial reality and the accepted function of liquidated damages. Parties agree a liquidated damages clause to provide a predictable and certain remedy. So the customer does not require to quantify its loss. That might be a difficult and time consuming task. There was no reason why the customer would forgo this benefit in the event the contract was terminated before work was completed. Parties were unlikely to intend that the right to liquidated damages, once accrued, was simply extinguished. The court said that the effect in law of a termination of contract is prospective only. Subject to contrary agreement, the parties are only discharged from obligations which would arise after termination, but not those which have arisen before. Parties should be taken to know the general law. The accrual of liquidated damages comes to an end on termination of the contract. After that, the contract's at an end and parties must seek damages for breach under the general law. That means that parties do not have to provide specifically for the effect of termination of their contract and their liquidated damages clause. They can take that consequence as read. The Court of Appeals approach meant that a supplier who had badly overrun the time specified for completion would have an incentive not to complete the work in order to avoid paying liquidated damages for the delay. And the court said it simply made no sense to create such an incentive. So turning to look at the clause in dispute, which was by way of reminder, triple point should be liable to pay the penalty from the due date for delivery up to the date PTT accepts the work. The Supreme Court held that ultimately the question of whether liquidated damages were due had turned on the wording of the clause. So was the purpose of it limited to liquidating damages for delay and completion, or did it also liquidate damages for failure to complete at all? The Supreme Court found that on its true construction, the clause provided for liquidated damages if Triple Point did not discharge its obligations within the time fixed by the contract, irrespective of whether PTT accepted any works completed late. It held that the clause provided an end date for liquidated damages on acceptance of the works by PTT to ensure there was no further claim for liquidated damages. It was not the case there would be no liquidated damages if there was no such acceptance of works. That would render the clause of little value in a commercial contract. And as the Supreme Court said, the Court of Appeals interpretation threw the baby out with the bathwater. So ultimately, the court held that the words up to the date PTT accepts such work should be interpreted as meaning up to the date, if any, PTT accepts such work. Moving on to look at two other issues which the Supreme Court dealt with in its decision. These both concerned the limitation of liability clause, um, which I've set out there. The total liability of triple point to PTT under the contract shall be limited to the contract price. This limitation on liability shall, shall not apply to triple points liability resulting from fraud, negligence, et cetera. So the, the second issue that the court had to decide after liquidated damages point was, where the damage is capped here. If it was found that Triple Point had acted negligently, the limitation liability clause would not apply, i.e. its liability would not be capped to the contract price. So what did negligence mean? The Court of Appeal had held that negligence meant tortious negligence. So therefore the cap applied because there was no negligence on the part of Triple Point proved under the general law of tort. The Supreme Court overruled that it said the interpretation was not the ordinary and natural meaning of the word. Negligence included all negligence in Triple Point's part, including its breach of contractual duty of skill and care, which had been proved. Therefore, the cap did not apply. So Triple Point was subject to unlimited um, liability here. The minority in the Supreme Court, which included Lord Hodge, um, the Scottish justice, held that negligence did not refer to negligence in the performance of Triple Point's obligations. They agreed with the Court of Appeal and the judge at first instance that because this contract was mainly for the provision of services and there was a contractual obligation on Triple Point to exercise reasonable skill and care, if it was found that that obligation, um, if they'd failed in that obligation and that was their main duty under the contract, that definition of negligence would render the cap toothless and of little protection to Triple Point. But as I said, that was the minority opinion. <clears throat> 
the final issue for the Supreme Court was, did liquidated damages count towards that cap in the limitation liability clause? And they held unanimously that yes, the cap embraced liquidated damages. So they counted towards the maximum damages that uh, PTT could recover. So finally, I've just got a few takeaway points. In terms of drafting um, your clauses here, liquidated damages clause, you don't need to specifically state that there's no requirement for the work to be completed and accepted, or and that there's liquidated damages accrue up to termination. However, if that's the intention, consider including those points for the avoidance of doubt. And limitation liability clause, consider including whether there's a cap on liability to pay liquidated damages and in what circumstances that will not apply and whether that includes contractual claims and whether the sums paid by way of liquidated damages count towards overall liability cap or are subject to a separate cap. And that's everything from me. Thank you, Monica. So I think that's, uh, I don't think, no questions at this stage. I'll maybe pick up with any questions for you, Monica, at the end once I've sure. done this quick kind of roundup of cases. So it's, it's left to me, like I said at the beginning, these are not IT specific cases in the, the, the way that the cases that Monica and Ross had spoken about are, but I think these do tap into issues which those of us are kind of advising on IT contracts will encounter. So it's just worth, again, looking at keeping up with looking at recent cases on these things just to see the way that uh, you know, the, the courts are assessing these sorts of things so that we can factor them in uh, when we're ad advising uh, our internal or external clients on these issues. And the first one that I wanted to cover off, which is every lawyer's favourite, um, notice provisions. Um, and the case, just moving on to the next slide, the case I just wanted to highlight on this one is the Court of Appeal case Dorica against United Luck Group. Holdings Limited. Now, this was a notice issued under a share purchase agreement. And the, 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 the point I really take from this is that the notice clause specified that in the notice, um, reasonable detail had to be given of the matter giving rise to the claim. And so, as is often the case where something is specified to be at a reasonable level, there was considerable debate about whether or not sufficient information had been given in order to amount to reasonable detail of the matter giving rise to the claim. And what was said by the Court of Appeal um, was that what was reasonable in a case like this depended on the circumstances. And the fact that in a case like this, some information was already known to the recipients of the notice was relevant, and I've quoted there from the, the judgment that what's reasonable takes its colour from the commercial purpose of the clause, and businessmen would not expect to require further detail which served no commercial purpose. And so that meant that in this case, a fairly limited amount of detail was considered to be reasonable. But I think the court did make clear here that this was relevant in the context of reasonable detail, but if the clause had specified that certain information required to be included in the notice, then even if that was information that was known to the recipient, that would not mean that that notice still required to contain that information if it was specified that that information had to be included. So the, the relevance of what was known by the recipients was only because there was a requirement here to include reasonable detail. If there was something that was specified in the clause, then even if that was known to the recipients, that would still have to be included in order for that notice to be valid. So as we often deal with, we will continue to be arguing about whether notices that have been given are sufficient uh, for some time yet. Moving on to the next area that uh, often causes consternation and debate, um, non-variation clauses. And um, Happily here, if we just move on, the, the case here is the KGS against KFG case. Now, again, not an IT contract, um, but this was a case where the Court of Appeal were considering in some detail um, an oral modification clause. Um, and obviously, again, a regular subject of debate in the context of IT contracts. Now, this was actually about whether or not KFG had by its actions effectively bound itself into an agreement that provided for arbitration. So this all arose in the context of proceedings to enforce an arbitral award. Now, none of that 
relevant for present purposes. But the, the key takeaway from this is now the fairly consistent approach of the English courts in relation to oral modification clauses. And that is to adopt a strict approach and to enforce these clauses. So as you would now expect, given the Rock advertising case, what the Court of Appeal here said was, you know, there, there needs to be compliance with this clause in order for there to be an amendment or a modification. And this clause itself required a written document executed by duly authorized representatives of both parties. Now here, KFG had, I think, paid invoices. Um, they had effectively, in a number of respects, acted as if they were bound by the agreement. But the Court of Appeal, following on from what was said in Rock Advertising, were very clear that the only circumstances in which those kinds of actions could amount to a variation would be if the party claiming that there had been a variation was able to bring themselves within estoppel type dicta. Um, and so effectively, there would require to be words or conduct unequivocally representing that the variation was valid, notwithstanding its informality. And that there, so therefore there was something more than just simply acting as if the party was bound by the agreement. So again, helpful for those of us who are looking to rely on an oral modification provision, those are now being enforced fairly strictly on the back of that rock advertising case. So it's not, if we're looking to say that there requires to be an amendment in writing, then absent um, something approaching estoppel or estoppel type dicta, then um, it is likely that that, that, that is going to, the, the court are going to uphold those sorts of clauses and there's some consistency there. Moving on, um, we've already spoken quite a bit, uh, Ross and Monica have both mentioned exclusion and limitation clauses, so I don't intend to spend a huge amount more time talking about them here. Um, other than just to kind of emphasize consistently to what we're seeing in relation to oral modification clauses, uh, the approach of the English court, certainly in relation to exclusion and limitation clauses, is again to apply them fairly strictly now in accordance with their terms. So if there is a tightly worded exclusion or limitation clause, then the court are going to look at the words and if the losses are covered by the exclusion or limitation clause, then in all likelihood that is going to be held to apply to those particular losses and you will not be able to recover um, those particular losses. And there was quite strong argument in this Mott McDonald case that this exclusion clause shouldn't apply to the particular losses that, it's, that were suffered. And this was in the context of fundamental, deliberate or willful breaches uh, by Mott. But the, the judge in this case was very clear that no, the wording of the clause was wide enough that it captured willful, deliberate or fundamental breaches by Mott. And therefore, um, there was no reason to interpret that clause differently. And even though it was a, if the allegation was that there was a more egregious type breach in order to exclude that from the ambit of the exclusion clause express wording would be required to do that as you know we will we will you would you would regularly see where there would be a carve out for willful um, deliberate or abandonment um, type issues but that was not here in a case like in this particular case and therefore the exclusion and limitation clause did apply. Um, apologies, the slide reads a bit as if it was a, a blanket exclusion clause of all losses. Um, it wasn't. There were categories of loss for which there was liability. So it's not that the clause read as if there was no liability at all. Um, it, there was specific liability and there was like a half a million pound cap. So it, it may have been that the idea of there being the commerciality that was applying to interpretation of that, if it was just a we shall not be liable for anything, then the position may have been different, but that wasn't the case in this particular instance. And then moving on, um, again, just again, the thorny issues that we, we deal with and advise on, and in this case, um, material breach, and in particular, this one, yeah, remedy and whether or not a material breach had actually been remedied. Um, actually, I mean, it's one of these ones where you kind of you, you wonder why it was still being litigated, because it does seem like it was a, in the context of 
advising about remedy and whether breaches have been remedied, this one looked as if it was maybe at the more straightforward end. Um, but Mr. Baines, um, in this case, uh, had been served with notice because he'd effectively told um, the respondent, the defendant party, that he was not going to perform his obligations, he wasn't going to do any work, and he was served with a notice. Um, requiring him to do uh, work and his solicitors wrote back saying that he intended to do some work but he didn't actually do any work and in those circumstances the court said well just writing back saying that you had an intention to do some work was insufficient when what you had was a clause in the contract that actually required you to actively perform your contract so you can't say that you've remedied it by demonstrating an intention to perform if the contract itself requires you actually to perform in order to remedy the breach so not a huge amount of guidance or assistance for those of us who are advising clients on whether breaches are or are not material in this one but again just showing that the issue of breach and particularly of, of whether a breach is capable of remedy and has been remedied is likely to provide fertile ground for us litigators uh, for quite a while to come yet. And just finally, the final case I just wanted to mention, and again, not an IT contract, not looking to go into this in any detail, but just a quick look at the, the case itself. So just the Wales case, it's just a flag that as those of us who are following um, you know, English case law, there's just a consistent approach to try to introduce or try to argue for implied duties of good faith into contracts. And this was just an, a, another attempt, an unsuccessful attempt, to argue that there was a duty of good faith. And the court were quite clear that in this particular context, which has no relevance to IT, it was an, an IFA and related to advising on pension scheme transfers, that there was no need or requirement to imply a duty of good faith, but had they done so, there would still not have been a breach, but that in a contract like this, there was a requirement that would commonly be implied to deal honestly. And I think in a commercial contract setting, um, we're generally still only really dealing with implied duties of good faith, um, where there are arguments about the, you know, your Braganza doctrine and whether or not discretions have been exercised reasonably or not. So if there's a, a discretion or a de decision to be made, I think it is now quite clear that it has to be shown that that has been exercised reasonably, but to the extent that that means that there is any wider duty of good faith implied into commercial contracts, it still seems like those who are trying to argue for that are experiencing difficulty because the court are effectively saying that there is, there is no need, you know, and if that was something that was going to be included in a contract, then that would require express wording in order to do that. I'm just going to have a quick check. That's that's everything that I um, had to say. Uh, so we'll just move on, see if there are any particular questions. I've just got a couple, um, and it's for you, Monica, that have just come in. And that's the first one is just, I think you said in the presentation that Lord Hodge had issued a dissenting opinion on an aspect of the case. And given that we are in Scotland, although we've all been speaking at length about English cases, does that, does that have any bearing in terms of the applicability of that case in Scotland? Um, well, the decision isn't, isn't binding in Scotland because it's an appeal from an English court. Um, it's it's not binding, but would be viewed as persuasive by the courts in Scotland. Um, so I think the fact that Lord Hodge dissented on that issue would potentially be taken into account by by some judges here um, if they're looking at similar issues of the meaning of negligence and limitation liability clauses. But um, the, 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 the fact that he dissented doesn't affect whether or not it is binding. It's, it's not binding anyway because it's not a Scottish appeal. And one second. And I think the, the, the other question we have here is just what, so obviously you spoke a lot about liquidated damages provisions in your presentation, but what, what's the position if there isn't, if there isn't a liquidate damages provision, um, what would be the, what would be the situation? How would the court approach that? So it's, you know, it's for parties to agree during the negotiation of a contract, whether to include a liquidated damages clause. If they do, then a fixed sum would be due to be paid if it's a breach of contract. If there's no such clause and there's a breach of contract, then the aggrieved party, normally in IT contracts, you're talking about the customer, must claim damages, i.e. compensation from the supplier. 
And that's more complicated because then they have to prove that the breach caused the loss and they've got to quantify it. And there could be disputes about remoteness. Is the loss complained of too distant from the breach to be recoverable? And mitigation of loss, should the customer have tried to limit their loss? Those issues don't affect liquidated damages. The, the court simply looks at what the rate is and applies that to it. So, um, you know, y yes, you can, yes, you can still recover damages, um, but liquidated damages clauses are there um, to, you know, to, to avoid, avoid all that hassle. And as I said during my presentation, they do provide certainty for both parties. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think three quarters, 45 minutes for a, a post lunchtime seminar is, uh, is, is, is more than enough time. So we've got contact details and things up there, but I think that's pretty much it from us. I'll just have a final check and see. Nope, I think we're good on, good on questions. So that just leads me to thank, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Ross. Uh, and I will just wrap things up now. But thanks again. Thank you.